I made a mistake while I was shaving and now I don't have a mustache anymore. So I'm sorry. I'm sure no one cares but me. It bothers me though. I thought I would share. This is a safe place. We're in a safe environment to talk about our feelings. And my feeling is I'm very upset, not relevant to the work that we need to do today. Just my insecurity laid bare. Like and subscribe. Hey everyone, it's me, Mike, and welcome back to Moby Dick Explained. This week we read four quick chapters, and I'm not going to remember them, so I'm going to read them. Chapter 10, A Bosom Friend. Chapter 11, Nightgown. Chapter 12, Biographical. And Chapter 13, Wheelbarrow. In these chapters, we're mostly spending time with Ishmael and Queequeg in New Bedford as they learn about each other and deepen their bond. It's definitely more straightforward than some of the other reading we've done, but as always, there's a lot to talk about. About. So let's get moving. Chapter 10, A Bosom Friend. After the sermon, Ishmael heads back to the Spouter Inn. Queequeg is already there, whittling on his little idol by the fire. And Ishmael is really taken by the calm comfort he seems to display, even in a place with strange people and strange customs. When I do the, when I read the selections, I'm going to have to hold this because I just can't see anything. Here was a man some 20,000 miles from home, thrown among people as strange to him as though he were on the planet Jupiter. And yet he seemed entirely at his ease, preserving the utmost serenity, content with his own companionship, always equal to himself. Compared to Ishmael, who seems always out of place and confused, so much so that just last night he got into a massive argument with the innkeeper. Queequeg is displaying a serenity that Ishmael finds almost profound. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. He says about Queequeg, you cannot hide the soul. And it's this warmth emanating from Queequeg's soul that Ishmael finds irresistible. Wild he was, a very sight of sights to see. Yet I began to feel myself mysteriously drawn towards him. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I, since Christian kindness had proved but hollow courtesy. There's an interesting story in here where Ishmael stops whittling his idol and starts paging through a big book that may be a Bible. He's illiterate in English, so he seems to primarily be focused on counting the pages. He would then begin again at the next 50, seeming to commence at number one each time, as though he could not count more than 50. And it was only by such a large number of 50s being found together that his astonishment at the multitude of pages was excited. Ishmael works his way over to Queequeg and the two men sit for a while with the book. But Ishmael doesn't devote that time to explaining the contents of the book. Instead, he talks about the purpose of books. We then turned over the book together, and I endeavored to explain to him the purpose of the printing and the meaning of the few pictures that were in it. It might be just a strange phrasing, where Melville really means Ishmael is explaining the book itself. But if not, it's a vexing question. Why focus on the concept of books themselves, or on the concept of printing rather than the story. Reading and literacy and inscription and the way we use language are all big themes in Moby Dick. We'll learn later about Queequeg's tattoos and the role they play in preserving his history and telling the stories of his culture. This is just one scene centering on the concept of writing and language, but there will be many. Next, the two men share a smoke and in doing so become forever bonded as best friends. He seemed to take to me quite as naturally and unbiddenly as I to him. And when our smoke was over, he pressed his forehead against mine, clasped me around the wa- clasped me round the waist, I can't say that one, clasped me around the waist and said that henceforth, henceforth, I'm struggling, and said that henceforth we were married, meaning, in his country's phrase, that we were bosom friends. He would gladly die for me, if need should be. Here's a question. Why does Ishmael feel such a strong, immediate bond with someone who's so different and so unknowable? One answer could be, as we've talked about before, at their core, Ishmael and Queequeg aren't really all that different. They're both strangers in a strange land, learning as much as they can and trying to find a place for themselves in the world. It's worth pausing here to talk about the elephant in the room. Many people who read Moby Dick 
feel as though Queequeg and Ishmael are queer coded, that their bond or marriage is more than platonic and is in fact a romantic love. And the way Melville has written it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. This is one of those things like Call Me Ishmael where you can read it however you want. There's enough ambiguity in the text to support our friends being lovers, or pals. I'll leave it up to you. Whatever you believe, whatever your headcanon is, it's right. At the end of this chapter, Queequeg invites Ishmael to participate in the ritual worship of his little idol. Ishmael struggles with this for a moment, sort of asking himself, is it okay for me as a Christian to be worshiping a little pagan idol? In the end, Ishmael determines that it is exactly his Christianity that demands he help Queequeg with his worship. But what is worship? To do the will of God. That is worship. And what is the will of God? To do to my fellow man what I would have my fellow man do to me. That is the will of God. Now, Queequeg is my fellow man. And what do I wish that this Queequeg would do to me? Why, unite with me in my particular Presbyterian form of worship. It's another compelling question for us as readers. What's the right thing to do here? Should you protest? Attempt to convert Queequeg? Refuse to participate? Is faith so fragile that humoring someone else's beliefs is enough to bring it all tumbling down? For Ishmael, the answer is no. For someone else, who knows? Chapter 11, Nightgown. This is a really short chapter, which mostly involves Queequeg and Ishmael laying in bed and having a chat. But there's one thing I do really want to share, and I'm just going to read the whole paragraph. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors. Indeed, out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room. The more so, I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth, some part of you must be cold. For there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. Nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable and have been so a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable anymore. But if, like Queequeg and me in the bed, the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then indeed, in the general context, consciousness, you feel most delightfully and unmistakably warm. For this reason, a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the coldness of the outer air. There you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal. This is one of my absolute favorite passages in Moby Dick, which is why I read the whole thing. There's something really beautiful about the idea that there's no warmth without cold, that there's no comfort without discomfort. Everything in this world we experience not in isolation, isolation, but in comparison, the day is warm, but it can't be warm on its own. It's warmer than yesterday. It's colder than tomorrow. Without the comparison, without the reference, there, there's no meaning. It echoes back to Ishmael talking about the winter wind and how your perception of that wind depends entirely on your circumstance. Viewed from within by a warm fire, the winter wind is a lovely companion. Viewed from outside, exposed to the cold, it is a vicious enemy. This little aside about being the warm spark in the arctic crystal is just so compelling to me. And it's also super true. For me at least, it's way nicer to be bundled up warm when the air has a chill. To find yourself in a situation where everything is always perfect means Everything is always the same because perfection can't change. And living like that, you would quickly realize, isn't comfort at all. At the end of this chapter, we begin to transition into a story about Queequeg's background. Chapter 12, Biographical. Queequeg is from a small island called Cocovoco. Cocovoco. Cocovoco? Cocovoco. Queequeg is from a small island called Cocovoco. Ishmael says about it, it's not down on any map. True places never are. It's kind of a hipster line, like the cool places are never on the map. 
Yeah, okay. All right, Ishmael, we get it. You knew about it before it was cool. Queequeg is some kind of royalty. His dad is a king, but he wants to set out and see the world. Queequeg's hope is to learn from Christians so as to improve the circumstances of his people. But he's in for a harsh lesson. He was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians, the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were. And more than that, still better than they were. But alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens. It's a theme we've seen again and again already in this book. The thin line between savage and civilized. And the constant drumbeat that Christianity, despite what some Christians may say, is not necessarily a synonym for good or right. Ishmael and Melville by extension, constantly question whether it is Christianity that makes men civil, or whether it's something more human and more universal. And that leads them to the next logical question, which is, if Christianity isn't needed for men to be moral, or if it often presents itself as a cause for the opposite, then what exactly are we doing with it? Chapter 12 closes out with Queequeg explaining to Ishmael that he's not quite ready to return home, as his time with Christians may have actually compromised his ability to ascend the throne. He answered, no, not yet, and added that he was fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of 30 pagan kings before him. But he does intend to return once he feels he's been baptized. Again, in this way, Queequeg and Ishmael are very similar. Neither seems able to return home, and both are searching for the answer on a whaling ship. In doing so, they've at least found each other as two sides of the same coin. Both are of the mind that the longest, hardest journey might be the one that leads them home. Chapter 13, Wheelbarrow. Chapter 13 is a bit more eventful than the other chapters we read this week. First, we spend some time with Queequeg and Ishmael on the docks, and there's a little story about a wheelbarrow. The story goes, the first time Queequeg saw a wheelbarrow, he had no idea how to use it. So he places it against his chest and hoists the arms, and he carries it like this. Or I always imagined him carrying it as a backpack, but it does say that he's got it on his chest. So he picks it up and like carries it like this instead of rolling it along. Ishmael's first question about this, of course, is whether anyone laughed at him because Ishmael is always super conscious of how he's perceived by others. Instead of answering the question, Queequeg tells Ishmael a story about a time when someone visited their island and misinterpreting the traditions ended up with their hands in a punch bowl, seeing himself placed next to the priest and noting the ceremony. The captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger glass. Now, said Queequeg, what do you think? Didn't our people laugh? In other words, of course people laughed. Of course they laughed at Queequeg carrying the wheelbarrow, just as they laughed at the captain sticking his hands in the punch bowl. But Queequeg doesn't carry any malice or concern from that moment because he understands that when someone comes into your world and acts in a way that seems strange, it's funny. It shouldn't be, but it is. And whether you are the native or the stranger, doesn't really change the fundamental truth. It's kind of funny that Ishmael asks this question after giving us a lecture that if someone laughs at you or you make someone laugh because of something you mess up, you should take joy in making them laugh. It shows that maybe that bit from Ishmael was kind of a cope for getting picked on by Peter Coffin. And it also shows that the things Ishmael tells us might not be things that he fully believes all the time. Finally, Ishmael and Queequeg set out on a schooner to Nantucket, and there's some mild drama. But first, there's a quiet reflection on what we would call the work, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for I.
Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness of all earthly effort. Every journey, no matter how fraught and perilous, has an end. But the end of one journey is the start of another, and another. Ishmael sees in the world the infinite cycle of time, the infinite pain of never stopping, of never resting. Same! After first making fun of and then being picked up and thrown by Queequeg, a random stranger is thrown overboard by a loose boom. Queequeg, showing his fast thinking and his sailor competency, manages to secure the boom no one else can manage. Then he leaps into the sea and, after several minutes, manages to rescue this overboard bumpkin. Two massive things here. First, we now know Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Queequeg knows what he's doing. He is a competent sailor. He's cool under pressure. Second, for this act, he accepts no praise. It sparks such a strong reaction in Ishmael that he says from now on he's going to cling to Queequeg like a barnacle. From Queequeg's perspective, it's just something he needed to do. And Ishmael regards it as Queequeg having taken on some sort of solemn responsibility. It's a mutual joint stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. A very famous Moby Dick line. In other words, no matter the belief, no matter the circumstance, we got to help each other out. In Moby Dick, selflessness is the strongest heroic contrast to the selfish, almost villainry we will see when we meet Captain Ahab. With all that said, the boys are now almost to Nantucket, and we'll pick up from there next time. Last time I forgot to write the chapter names down, but I have them here this time. Next time we're going to read chapters 14, 15, and 16, Nantucket, Chowder, and The Ship. 14 and 15, quick and easy. 16, a little longer, so pace yourself. Anyway, until I see you again, please be good, be kind, don't kick any puppies, and thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment. I want to know what you think about the Quishmel romance, especially. Romance? Romance? Romance. I want to know what you think about the bromance, especially. And there's only a couple of days left to get the June Patreon sticker club reward.